88, take three, sound speeds. Sound speed. Camera speed. Scene 88, take three, marker. Here we go. And action. What makes this possible is handles. An invention that, that came up with the digital audio workstation Hollywood had no idea about until they started doing OMF. Everybody knows what handles are? Let's, let's do a real quick, anybody not know what handles are? Okay, let's, let's do a very, very quick thing. When, when the editor edits the picture, as he does a track, okay, here, here's a voiceover track from a TV show. Uh, these are the actual edits that the editor handed me. You can see I've got a little icon on them because when he hands me his stuff, I don't want to mess with it because it's in sync. Uh, these are the clips as he edited them on his machine, which I then rolled into my workstation. Uh, and if you wait, when the cursor gets right around here, at about 6.49, if you can make out the time code, uh, there's a stumble. And, you know, I'm, I'm reviewing the dialogue. This is a TV show. I don't have very much time to work on it. Uh, and I've got to do sound effects and noise reduction, as it were, and music cutting. But I just did not like the way that he uh, said he is sure the bulls are close. They're obviously hunting bulls. Uh, because he, he, he just stopped for no good reason. And you can even see the stop in what the editor handed me. Brush. Bull Cape Buffalo have only two real predators, lions and man. Adrian grabs his gun. He's sure the bulls are close. It just did not sound right to me. And what the heck, they, they come to me to fix these things, and it only took about 20 seconds because of the handles. Okay, these are the two tracks, the two clips that the editor handed me. What you can do is actually open them up and depending on what the editor sends you, you can go out two or three seconds beyond where he cut and hear what was past his edit point. It's a handle you can grab and drag the edit longer. Now, normally what you're doing with that <clears throat> is fixing edits because when the picture editor is editing picture and sound, he must edit on frame lines every 30th of a second or every 24th of a second for film. That's a very long time for dialogue, a 24th of a second. Uh, the, the T in 24th of a second lasted about a third of that length. Uh, but he has to edit on frame lines. So frequently you will grab an edit and just slide it a little bit one way or another. But if you grab the edit and you slide it all the way open, you can hear what the original was. Adrian grabs his gun. He's sure the bulls, the bulls, Adrian grabs his gun. He's sure the bulls are close. Adrian grabs his gun. Okay, that's from the original, just by opening up the handles. Uh, it's obvious that they took Adrian grabs his gun from one take, and by the time he got to, he's sure the bulls are close. The, the, the poor narrator was so messed up, he just did not do a good reading. So what I did, again, editing phonemes, this is his track here. The cut is on the B in bulls, and it's absolutely transparent. I know I can do that because B is a plosive consonant. And that's one of the rules of phonetics. There's actually a hole in there where you can edit. Here's what the whole track sounded like. Now this has added a little bit of music and some sound effects. What you'll hear is his voiceover track, the production sound effects that they handed me, plus some additional sound effects that I rolled in, plus music that doesn't show on the screen. Bull Cape Buffalo have only two real predators, lions and man. Adrian grabs his gun. He's sure the bulls are close. And you just cannot hear the edit on bulls. Even if I muted everything else. I just didn't feel like doing a muted version uh, for this demo, which uh, actually brings us to the whole idea of mixing. That's, that's, yeah. Sorry, just go back one step to the uh, two weeks. Um, yeah. How did you get access to the other tape? Where oh, the question is how did I get access to the other takes? I'm repeating it for the benefit of the camera. Uh, in the two weeks clip, they, they gave me a big cardboard box full of DVDs. I knew I had to find other takes. I knew I had to find other readings. Uh, I had in front of me the script book, which showed where each shot is broken down 
and which takes were used and which were printed and which were actually used. And I had the sound log. The script book tells me what page of the sound log has the sound recordings for those takes. Then I went over to the big cardboard box of data DVDs and pulled out the eight track DVD of all the takes from that hour's shooting, loaded it into my workstation, sunk it right up. Now I had isolated microphones and I could take the one I wanted. Uh, in this case, actually, because the location mixer did a very good job just handling the boom mic, I only used the mono mix. But yeah, uh, it's part of the workflow. We're passing the original back and forth. On TV shows, they generally don't pass me the production stuff. If I can't get what I want from the handles and can't manufacture it, then I will call up the editor and say, hey, this take at this time code, you have an alternate? Okay, and he sends it to me by email. Gotta love the internet. You gotta wonder how FedEx is making any money these days. Okay, but we were getting into mixing. That's, that's where they actually uh, did something for financial reasons uh, that, that, that they were doing much better than we were here on the East Coast. Here, here's a typical videotape mix. The picture editor has edited four scenes together, say. Uh, and there's a slight difference at point A, the tape's moving this way, so we see point A, and then point C goes back, but this gray stuff is a slightly different sound, and then B is a slightly different sound. Uh, so when you're mixing, you move the fader up and down. You reach over, you grab the equalizer. You're working on music console, basically. Uh, you got channel equalizers. Uh, sometimes you might bring something up on two tracks and cut between them. But generally what you'll do is you just, you, you, you'll cheat it. And if necessary, go back and slowly tweak the automation. But you do it on the fly. Okay, that, that works for videotape. Because remember, this was a real-time medium. Film. Now, here's a very short scene cut together from a lot of different takes. And that's after the dialogue editor has gotten through with it, of course. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of takes. What do you do to compensate for all these things? Well, if you tried to move your fingers or even program the automation, you can't. So Hollywood studios, back in the studio system, back in the days of Big Bag Dubbers said, okay, let's simplify things for the mix. The way that we're gonna simplify things for the mix is by making the editor work harder. Remember, the dialogue editor is working on a single Moviola or Steenbeck or, or Rewind sync block, uh, and the and nowadays working on a workstation, but on his kitchen table, he's cheap. The mixer, you want to be able to do things quickly because he's in the expensive room and he's the high-priced talent. So what you do is you take that track, the editor takes the track, and splits it into, in this case, four separate tracks, one for each of the little audio pieces. Now, I, I drew perfs to sort of simulate film to remind you that this is a film technique. Of course, you do this in a workstation, uh, and what you get is silence on the tracks between. What you also do, and I didn't illustrate it, is you do a little fade out and fade in. So they're less than a frame. A couple of milliseconds. <coughs> Say hi to the frog. A couple of milliseconds of, of, of just overlap. So now, here's what the mixer can do. Program four separate channels. One for each. And let it go by. I do this now on complicated films. Uh, even the... Uh, in a moment, I'm going to show you the trailer for that, uh, you know, the, the short preview trailer for that apocalyptic, uh, post-apocalyptic sitcom. Uh, and even on that, on that one scene where they're on the road, I broke it into two tracks so that I could handle the differences, even though the, basically it was one scene, but so that I could cover when we go from one mic to another, and then programming my, my automation. I was able, okay, let's patch in an equalizer here, program all that stuff, and make a dialogue premix. Jay. Yeah. How are you breaking this up? Uh, in this case, well, that's a very good question. How am I breaking it up? In this case, I'm breaking it up by color. Uh, in, in a real film situation, you might be breaking it up by actor. Even though the two people were picked up with one boom, they might need different processing or slightly different levels. You might be breaking it up by actor plus 
One actor shouted, let's put him on another track. Basically cutting and pasting. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was answering the wrong question. Yes, I'm basically, back in the days of mag film, you would cut it up into little pieces. And what they do is take uh, old developed film uh, and basically use that as leader because it's non-magnetic. And they put that in between. But you the same thing as pay for a leader on quarter inch. Uh, what I do now on a workstation is, you know, I've got my locked copy that came from the editor. I make a copy of that that's my working copy, and I just make a razor cut each place that I want to switch to another track, and by, you know, holding down the key that constrains it for time, drag it to another track. Uh, since I'm using a workstation that makes uh, crossfades and fadeouts very, very easy, basically I, I just have a key that I tap that applies the proper fades. Uh, does that answer your question, John? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one other thing about the mixing, about the splitting, actually, this, this pertains to your question, too. Uh, dialogue is mono. This is something they, they learned in Hollywood. Uh, it isn't something we learned in TV, because TV started out, the whole show was mono, and then the whole show was stereo. Uh, what they learned in Hollywood is dialogue is mono. Dialogue lives in the center. The center belongs to the dialogue. Sometimes. When it's done right. No. I, okay, there are special effects. There are films where dialogue is panned all over the place. I know. And you know why they're painful to watch? Uh, what they discovered. Okay. In, you're right. And John is an expert on theater sound and designs the speakers that live behind the curtain, behind the screen in a theater. He knows what he's, yeah. Some of them, they bounce around. In a lot of productions, uh, they'll use, they'll, they'll pan the dialogue if somebody's off screen. But even though you might have two actors on a screen, it's rare to pan the actors left and right. And there's just a very good financial reason for it. It all comes down to money in the Hollywood system. Let's say you've got a nice stereo theater. Let's say it's got decent acoustics. So you've got a sweet spot. People here are going to hear nice, true stereo. People everywhere will hear something. Uh, but what about these guys? They're in the sour spot. If they're looking at a picture of two actors, and one actor's voice is over here, and one actor's voice is over here, this actor's going to blast them. What about a guy over here? That gets even worse, because you've got level and uh, timing giving priority effect That'll force the voice all the way to the side, even though the, he might be looking to the middle of the screen. Go ahead. Yeah, question. Is there any success using phasing information rather than panning? Not, not in during the mix. Uh, you also don't want to mess with the phasing information uh, because that's going to throw off encoding when the thing goes to Dolby Stereo. It would have to be recorded that way. Perfect. Right. Oh, rec it's always recorded in mono with isolated because cause we have one, one mouth. And because of this convention, what they did to fix the sour spot problem was a center channel. Uh, and the center speaker is fed. It might be derived. It might be encoded. But there is a dialogue channel. And dialogue lives in the center. So if you've got music and sound effects. You should clarify that. Okay. How would you like me to clarify that, John? Well, I, I bow to your, 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 your knowledge of theater sound. Um, the dialogue generally lives in the center, but with everything else. Well, when you're actually mixing, uh, you might not want everything else to be there. But it is. It might not be. <laughs> if you listen to a soloed center track, you might be surprised. Oh, I've done that. Yeah. But uh, I'm saying that there are music and effects. There are music and effects. What, what I will frequently do, uh, or the, the re-recording mixer, I, I have been in mix sessions where I'm up on the dais because I'm the sound supervisor and there are these two guys down here including the high-priced talent, the re-recording mixer who's the head of that and it's his, his dub stage and I'll see him turn to the composer and say you put the damn soloist in the middle, that's my space and then he'll do some tricks with phase on the middle channel, on the center channel of the 5-1 music mix to spread it out I do that frequently on music uh, particularly if it's going to TV because in TV, you don't have a center speaker in a lot of cases. Or you might just have one speaker. You want to make sure the dialogue stays clean. Uh, if there's a soloist that has been panned to the middle in music, 
a lot of times, even on TV projects, I will ask for solo tracks. So that, I, you know, uh, you do your mix, but isolate them and hand me a multi-track mister, a multi-track wave, uh, so that I can just pan the vocalists a little bit. Or I'll use delays or mid-side tricks, a bloom line shuffler, to spread something out. Let me give you a practical example of that from the Sally Field movie. You know, here's an example of where we don't want things in the center, because I want dialogue in the center. Uh, one of the scenes takes place in an airport, small airport at night, when, when one of the uh, children, uh, one of the grown children is arriving to be with mom and sister is already there and meets him, and they've got some emotional dialogue, uh, but she greets him at the plane. It's a little commuter plane. It's a very small airport, and it's got to be at night. So there's still some footsteps because people are getting off the plane. Uh, but I, I, I wanted something that would suggest the, uh, the, the airport and be footsteps but not interfere at all with dialogue. So I took a standard recording of an airport. Can I stop it? If I stop it, will it start again from the same place? Yes, okay. Uh, mono recording, ran that through basically complementary comb filters. You remember the Orban stereo synthesizer? Uh, basically that process, you do a comb filter and then you add and subtract the comb filter. So the left has one set of bumps, right has one set of bumps, and you spread the thing out in stereo. That's not enough to do the job, but here's what that did to this mono track. Wait a second. If you watch the little speaker icon, you can see when I'm playing solos. Here's the stereo. Much wider. Virtually nothing in the center on a phase scope. Just enough so that if somebody's listening in mono, they'll still hear the airport. Uh, it also sounds kind of hollow because of the phase trick that I did. Let me stop right after that. Because this is a fixed comb filter. It adds a metallic ringiness, even though I made it wider. So I didn't want this to be the only effect. Wait till it finishes. So I took a stock footsteps effect, which is mono, and basically copied it onto two tracks about 30 seconds different. Panned left, not, not all the way left and right, panned about two-thirds and one-third. So you get this, one track and the other. Then I added one more thing. This is an airport at night, so the PA system is going to be a little bit more casual. Uh, I had an actor handy and recorded. Two, five, that's three, two, five, John. Just you know, a little PA announcement. Here's what the background sound effect sounded like. This is stereo with very little in the middle, and it left plenty of room for the two actors. John Dow, 325, that's 325, John. So, the magic, really, is paying careful attention to the craft. Let me show you how it all puts together. I uh, have, and timing's perfect, I have the uh, trailer runs roughly a minute uh, from, from that uh, post-apocalyptic sitcom. The road scene is in it, but shortened, uh, plus some other scenes. Uh, and that's, that's this one. Uh, this was just basically a trailer they did. It's on the web, uh, if you want to see it again. But they did this primarily for the networks to evaluate. So there are one or two little shortcuts taken. Uh, they stole a piece of picture. Uh, you, will, you will notice which one is stolen. And they said, uh, Jay, you got a good voice. Why don't you do the voiceover? Uh, I am not Don LaFontaine. <laughs> I, I did what I could. But the reason I brought it, we talked about the magic mic, the little uh, B6. I recorded the voiceover that you're going to hear on this mic, this very mic. Uh, I did that so that I could have a headset on for my telephone and the director could direct me, he's in New York. So the voiceover, it's not quite as nice as my 414, but it's damned good for an incredibly tiny little mic. But here, here's the whole thing put together.
After a series of epic disasters, chaos rules for those who survive. This world needs a leader, and I'm going to be that leader. Out of the ashes, one couple braves the open road to find new hope, new friends, and a new home. This is their story. Would you ever eat somebody? No. Really? No. Seriously, come on. No way. What about Darren Sims? I would totally eat him, but he deserves it. Totally. His oh. stupid wife. I, I don't know. I mean, I'd eat him, but I've never even met her. Soul dream homes just to earn my pay. Notice how the voices are panned. Played my games every single day. So that I could have some room for the dialogue in my voiceover. And it starts to rain, it suddenly pours. We live through famines and we live through wars. Walk this earth, never miss a beat. Who knew apocalypse could be so sweet? <laughs> oh! <laughs> get in there, get in there. Okay, oh! Because baby, no matter what, baby, The Walkers. It tastes like chicken. Oh. It really does. Oh. oh, you'd never know. There is a punchline, which I'm not going to play you. Uh, but if you want, I've got another slide here where I can show you actually the tracks that I used for doing that. Uh, I, I, I work primarily in Noendo. It, it, it's a lot faster for what I'm doing than Pro Tools. Uh, can we make out? Yeah, you can pretty much make out the titles of the tracks on the big screen. Uh, dialogue A and Dialogue B were what the editor handed me. So you see those are muted, but you'll also see the cuts that I made. Uh, that's me, the voiceover. Uh, proc, I guess, is the dialogue premix. PFX would be the production effects, things that happened that were picked up on the set that I wanted to treat as sync sound effects. But then there are background effects in stereo. Uh, there are also effects that I added. And I've got two tracks of stereo music. And of course, I mixed in stems so that I could control the overall level. We could also do a version without music. And we could also do a version without voiceover. Uh, this is a tiny little screen. Obviously, when I'm working, I, I have my 32-inch LCD for the picture. But this will keep you in sync. Uh, and if you watch the cursor, you can see the tracks going by that built that. After a series of epic disasters, chaos rules for those who survive. This world needs a leader. Here's the dialogue premix and the tracks that put it together. to be that leader. Out of the ashes, one couple braves the open road to find... A couple of music edits to make the peak happen at the right time. This is their story. Would you ever eat somebody? No. Look at all the cutting I had to do in the voice there. Seriously, come on. No way. What about Darren Sims? I would totally eat him. But he deserves it. Totally. His stupid wife. I, I don't know. I mean, I'd eat him, but I've never even met her. Soul dream homes just to earn my pay, but I came home to you. Played my games every single day, but I was home for you. And it starts to rain, it suddenly pours. If you look carefully, you'll see when they spin the bottle on the canvas. The mic didn't pick that up, so I had to add that in my studio. Apocalypse could be so sweet. <laughs> oh! <laughs> See, it had its own little track there. Oh! Because baby, no matter what, baby, through hellfire, baby, I got you. Do, 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 do. Separate footsteps. The walkers. It tastes like chicken. Oh! Uh, it really does. Oh! Oh, you'd never know. Mm. You could even see where I cut in that extra um at the end. That's basically how you make a film sound good in, in a short version. Actually, uh, well, we have a cartoon. We have time if there aren't that many questions. Uh, it looks like there's going to be another feature. Uh, are there any questions first? John? The distortion in that, where is that coming? Uh, the hookup between here and there. Sorry. 
Uh, it, it, it's. Uh, Somebody could have brought some nice speakers tonight. <laughs> yeah, and then I would have given you a digital feed. Is that one of my theaters? This is a, I don't know, it came from Images Google. Uh, Wait, it's me. Oh, yes, but there's nobody there. I, I just wanted to show you, go ahead, question. Yeah, yeah um, could you summarize real quickly uh, what uh, effect or what tracks you would uh, center and what tracks you would add? Uh, okay, dialogue is definitely centered unless there's an effect going on. Uh, production effects, effects that should belong to the actor, like his footsteps, I will put with the dialogue. If, if for some reason the dialogue is panned or stereo, fine. But if they're, di if they're center, I'm going to center those. Uh, in building the stems, they'll be on a separate master track so that a foreign language can handle the voice separately from the footsteps. Uh, but then the crowd footsteps, they're going to be panned. What you do with the surrounds behind you, that's, that's still up for grabs. There are a lot of different philosophies. There's a music style where you put yourself right in the middle of the band. There's a theatrical style where everything happens up there and there's reverb behind you. There's acting up front and music behind you. There, 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 John? Well, then there's Toy Story 3. I didn't see it yet. Well, Toy Story 3 was mixed with four surround channels. Yeah. I may have been the first to ever mix with four surround channels about 15 years ago. I don't know. I, I've not heard of anybody doing it before that. But these are four discrete surround channels where you have the left side wall and the right side wall and the back rear yeah. and, and left and right. And that gives a, a mixer a lot more... Uh, let, me, let me just interrupt for a second. In a normal 5-1 theater, You've got the left and right and center. Uh, and what happens with the surrounds is they sort of wrap around behind you, and a bunch of speakers will be carrying the same material. No, they won't. They won't. No. Okay. Uh, in fact, well, they will be in, with 35 millimeter optical, with yeah. Dolby stereo. The surround track is obviously part of the main mix, and it's, it's derived as a left minus right. But in discrete, with, you know, digital, digital cinema, uh, 70 millimeter, the, uh, all of those discrete surround tracks were in fact discrete, ah, uh, are discrete, yeah. and separate, and who knows what it would be. But with Toy Story, what we had was four separate surround channels. Now, you might have the same, you know, wind in the trees in all of them at one point, but you might have the ball that's bouncing around the room bouncing from one surround channel to another. Gosh, I, I, would, I would want to spread the wind then also, even if I do phase tricks with it, to make well, it bigger. You understand what I'm saying? That yeah. There are effects that are going to be very directional and right. effects that are, that are very omnidirectional right. and, and just omnipresent. That, that's been pretty much the history of surround sound. Did everybody hear John's comment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that uh, the, the very first films mixed in surround uh, in, in the current generation, like, like the first Superman, uh, they're, they're, they're trying everything. They're trying to put... The, the open fields where, where, where baby Clark is growing up, trying to surround you with that, even though the dialogue's up front. If you, if you watch some of those films and surround, what were they thinking? Well, what they were thinking was, we've got this new tool, let's deal with it. And, and Well, that one, Superman and Apocalypse were the first movies mixed with stereo surround in modern time. Yeah. There were Cinerama pictures that had split surround. Yes. But uh, they were mixed and they, they were encoded in a way that they would reside on six channels on 70 millimeter tracks, yeah. on 70 millimeter prints. And there weren't very many movies made that way. There may be 20 or 30 yeah. made that way. And then they also went into conventional mono and stereo release. That's well, the, on a six track 70 millimeter print encoded for stereo surround, uh, well, I'm gonna back up. The original 70 millimeter format was five speakers behind the screen and a mono surround channel. Uh, the baby boom format said, let's eliminate the left center and right center and make that subwoofer tracks. So that left high frequency information unrecorded on those tracks. The surround track would be the mono surround track, track number six. For stereo surround, what they did was they left the mono surround track up to 250 hertz. From 500 hertz on up, if the theater was equipped for it, they would take the uh, high-frequency information and store it on the left-center and right-center tracks, but play it through the surrounds. 
that made it compatible with theaters that didn't have the stereo surround setup. But today, everything is discrete and full bandwidth. And that raises another interesting point. If you're mixing film or TV, uh, is yeah, you can do all sorts of wonderful things in the dub stage, but they're also going to want to show this on TV. And it might go on the web. And this is just a side note. Mix, mix so that it's right for, for the audience you're trying to impress and so it satisfies you, but make sure it's mono compatible. Listen in, if you, if, if you don't naturally mix in a way, this also harks to your question of where, where do you put things in the stereo spread. Uh, until you're actually used to this, uh, every good console uh, plus any good workstation has a mono button. Uh, and you can, you can hook up a phase scope. Uh, make sure that, that things aren't getting lost. I have, I, back uh, in the earlier days, I had occasion to mix a stereo show and somebody dubbed it inverted on one channel and didn't notice because he had stereo monitors in his dub room and didn't, you know, he, he was sitting fairly close so he had a, an abnormal spread anyway, didn't notice there was no center. The producer heard it and said, gee, the music's great, what happened to the voiceover? <laughs> Always check mono. Okay, time for, yes, question. What are you doing about levels? Is it all dependent on... Ah, uh, there is a... <laughs> John and I could probably go all night on this one. There is a standard. The dub stage is calibrated to a standard, which Simpty has said, which everybody agrees to. Uh, it's much easier in the digital world where we have agreed that minus 20 dBFS from a single speaker is 85 dB SPL at the, list, at the listening position. Uh, some people use 82 dB in much smaller rooms. That's actually what I use. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but they're, those are the two standards, or the, the standard. Uh, however, where the dialogue goes against that, that 85 dB, where the sound effects goes, uh, in the film world, that's really up to the director and the producer and the mixer, and it's a battle. And there was one scene in that Sally Field movie where because the daughter was freaking out in a rainstorm and mother's breathing was very labored and there was thunder and the music's building and there was one point in the mix, I'm up on the dais and I'm talking to the two mixers and I say, gentlemen, I still have a bit left, fill it. <laughs> we went to within a quarter dB of full scale for a moment of that. Uh, in TV, however, now, uh, there, there are rules and regulations and dialogue has to be normalized to certain points and I'm not going to get into that. There was a SIMTI meeting about that about six months ago that was fascinating. Uh, what's also fascinating is that uh, I don't do very many commercials anymore. I'm too old to go out drinking with the people from Hill Holiday. That was a large part of my career. Uh, but they, 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 they will still come and say we want to be the loudest thing. So you're constantly working on ways with density and how you use a compressor. Secret, if you're using a compressor on a mix for TV or film, uh, set the threshold very, very low. So there's an awful lot of compression going on, but set the ratio very low also. It'll control things without sounding squashed. Then use multiband and pay careful attention to your attack and decay times. Anyway, that's probably more technical than I wanted to get into in this. Read my books. Uh, any other questions, John? Just one thing that you didn't mention. Oh, know. plenty that I didn't mention. Well, we're talking about dialogue being in the center. Mm. One of the <coughs> tricks when you're dealing with, uh, you know, three or more screen channels is, is particularly if somebody is singing or you want reverberation, uh, and yeah. the, the center will often be recorded dry and all of the reverberation in the outer channels. Yes. Yeah, that, yeah. That's a, a very Act nice way to keep things clean. Actually, Dave Moulton has a technique that he uses for his music recording <laughs> students. Uh, with, with a stereo music mix that you think is pretty good, commercial mix, not one that you've done, uh, take it, flip one channel, mono it, and listen to just the stuff that's out of phase. You'd be amazed at what's planted on the sides only. 
And yes, yeah, you do. Uh, frequently, you'll put reverb in the surrounds and let let the whole hall reverb. That's that's actually the the theater philosophy that I was talking about, where the action's taking place up front, but you've got this acoustic around you. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. What about tricks for taking something that was close mic, probably like in an, I, I know you're saying. What, what about what? tricks for taking? Can I can I guess your question? Something that's close mic uh, and like a lav and making it cut with the boom. World, worldizing, yeah. What, what kind of techniques do you use? No, you're not worldizing. Uh, worldizing is the technique of actually blasting it through a speaker and picking it up on a mic, which is something that I don't do anymore because it sounds too good. Uh, the PA system uh, in the airport and the, uh, the TV track in the uh, trailer, uh, in both cases I was just using plugins for distortion, compression, and filtering because it's more controllable. But, but the classic way to do that is you put a four-inch speaker in the booth and mic it. <laughs> Uh, that's worldizing. No, that's not what you do with closed dialogue. If you've got a situation where there's a lav and a boom, very frequently you come into this. Uh, even single actor on a single camera shot, I do this a lot in TV, they'll have a lav and a boom, and I'll use the lav as the primary, but whoops, there's a noise in the room, and I'll take one word from the boom. Or I'll use the boom as the primary because it sounded be I I'll use the lav... Yeah, I'll use the lav as the primary because it sounded better, but uh, talent hit the mic. So I got to take that phrase. Uh, so how do you, you put them on separate tracks? Uh, obviously match the level first. Also do a tiny little crossfade in the tracks. You'll never get the, you'll never move sliders that fast. Do it in the tracks, build a fade into the track so you're not wasting automation on it. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Make the edit on a hard consonant if at all possible. Never make the edit in a pause in the speech, because those are the ones that you can hear. If you make the edit in a consonant, the word, the word just carries your ear across it. And then it's a question of equalization first, and then just a tiny bit of reverb. Don't use the presets in your reverb plugin. They're all written for music. Think about the room that he's in and actually set up the reverb, unless you've got a good sampling reverb from a very similar room, and even then knock it back. Better to have too little than too much. Uh, and that's how you do it. And that, that's, you know, there's stuff all through my mixes. That is a combination of tight mics. Obviously a voiceover, you want the tight sound. The voiceover guy lives in limbo. Uh, I, I hate putting echoes on voiceover. I think it's totally wrong. He should be in your space, not, not some uh, other space. Anyway, go ahead. Question. You talked about making your cut uh, in the consonant rather than between the words, and this is something I've done. You know, I've recorded people in public and taken a 45 or 55 minute speech and put 1,800 cuts to clean out their arms and eyes. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if that's even in my head. I'll have to chew on that for a while. Is this because of a room reflection that's going to come after? No, it? no, it's a psychoacoustic trick. Even with a dry catch. Right. Definitely, you don't want to cut in a pause if there's room noise because you'll hear the room noise cut. One thing I didn't mention, and I think a lot of people are doing, uh, about noise, and then we'll get to the cartoon. Uh, a lot of people think that you've, you've got, okay, a couple of noisy shots cutting in and out, and maybe a non-noisy shot, maybe an airplane in one angle and not in the other. How do you fix it? Uh, well, I'll just roll some other noise throughout the whole scene. Don't do that. What you're doing is throwing away signal to noise. The best way to handle that kind of thing, let's say we've got a scene with two camera angles, one of them had an airplane, one of them didn't. Find an appropriate airplane, feather it in for about two or three seconds before you make the cut. And let the cut carry you past it. Somebody say something there? No? Okay. Uh, never ever roll room tone. I use room tone a lot. I use room tone to fill holes, and I fade in and out of it. I use room tone when I've got a, an effect that I recorded or took from a library that I want to have match something that was in the scene. <clears throat> or if a character slams a door on camera and I don't like the door slam, I can't just take out the door slam and put my own in. I have to patch where the door slam was with appropriate room tone or else you'll hear silence. That's a good use for room tone. Uh, and frequently you get room tone out of those handles and you'll just take a second or two from the handle uh, and loop it with a forward and a backward loop. 
So as the room tone changes, it changes back and changes and changes back. It's called a C loop. And you take the two of them, one forwards, one backwards, and then loop that as many times as you need. Uh, but that's getting into different tricks. It's time for the cartoon. Uh, when my disc wakes up. Oh, disc. There we go. Oh, I see we're masked to three by four for this. Uh, that is because this is from 1929. When theaters first got wired for sound across the country. You ever hear the phrase, somebody's wired? That phrase refers to the early days of talkies, when the silent theaters had to convert, and it was the latest thing. Well, Western Electric, who had one of the two competing systems for sound on film, decided to make a movie that could run in these theaters once the theater got converted to talk about what's actually going on, how you make a soundtrack. And they hired uh, the guy, who did, Mike Fleischer, cartoonist who did Coco the Clown and Out of the Inkwell, and then later did some of the really great Popeye. But his early stuff was a combination of live action and drawings right on the cell with the live action process called rotoscoping. <coughs> Western Electric hired him to make this cartoon. Figured it would be appropriate for this. W.E. Erpy is the Western Electric Research Lab. This was amazing. Audiences had never seen anything like this. Hey, Mew, what's the big idea of busting up my act? Wait till the character starts talking, and you'll discover that they hadn't yet developed a technique for moving lips in sync with speech. Why, Muty, I'm a new man. Haven't you heard about the wonderful thing Dr. Weston did for me? He pepped up my pulse, gave me a set of vocal cords. You ought to see him. Take it from me, you'll never land a job the way you are. Let's go. Here we are. Hello, Talkie. What's on your mind now? Doc, my old friend Muty wants you to put him through the works. Why, man, you still run on 60. We'll have to pep you up to 90. Open your mouth. Yeah. Come right along with me. Notice the vocal effects for the carpenters? Now, Talkie, let's put on an act. Permit him follow us through. Now I'll explain. In 
Inside this booth is a motion picture camera which is taking pictures through this window. We use a soundproof booth. When it's closed, it keeps the camera noise away from the microphone. The camera is operated by a motor which runs at exactly the same speed as the motor in the sound machine. Whew, it's hot in this booth. Let's get out on the set again, and I'll show how the sound is picked up by the microphones on the stage. Sound waves are picked up by this wonderful mechanical ear, the microphone, which is really a glorified telephone transmitter. Yes, the first talkies use carbon mics. The sound waves into electrical vibrations, which are amplified here and sent along these wires to the mixer room. The sounds from the stage microphones are mixed here so that the natural for the action in the production. Mr. Mixer sees the actors through this window and hears them only through this horn. Now that we've got the sound right, I'll show you how it's amplified. Get ready. The power from the microphones is amplified about 10 million times by these vacuum tubes, making the voice current strong enough to operate the machine that photographs the sound. Do you follow me? This is the machine that is used to record the sound on film. This sound film is traveling at the same rate of speed as the picture film in the camera booth. The light valve has two thin metal strings stretched across this tiny slit. On one side of the slit is a strong light, while on the other is a film, moving at exactly the same speed as the picture camera in the studio. The greatly amplified voice current passing through these tiny light valve strings move them to closer together or further apart thus changing the size of the slit. Therefore, the light varies as it passes through this rapidly changing opening, leaving a true photographic record of the voice currents on the film. Simple, isn't it? Huh? Now let's look at the films after they've been developed. Well, here we are. Here are our two negatives developed. The next step is to print these two negatives onto a third piece of film. We'll print the sound record first and then the picture record. Here we have a completed sound print and we are now ready for projection. This is the picture and sound projector. One motor drives both the picture and sound equipment. You see? Let me illustrate this with a simple diagram. This lamp illuminates the soundtrack on the film. The light from the lamp passes through the slit, throwing a very narrow line of brilliant light on the soundtrack. As the film runs past this light, the marks on the soundtrack cause the light to increase and decrease. This light, in turn, causes the current through the photoelectric cell to increase and decrease, thus reproducing the electric vibrations first created by the sound waves. The current from the photoelectric cell is pepped up by the amplifier, and then this amplified current is carried by wires along through the theater and down to the screen on the stage to connect with the loudspeakers. This is a typical layout of the stage set with two horns behind the screen. The receivers connected to the horns convert the electrical vibrations back into sound waves exactly the way the telephone receiver operates so that while the picture is being shown, the sound which was recorded is reproduced in step with the picture. The screen is full of small holes so that the horns may be placed behind the screen to let the sound through. This gives the illusion that the sound is coming from the image of the speaker. Talkie, there goes your cue. You're next on screen, while Muti can go try on his new voice.
I don't know why Muti was single perf. Uh, there, there, there was no 35 millimeter single perf. 16 millimeter, which wasn't invented at this time, did use single perf for sound, not for silent. Uh, I guess Fleischer was just taking artistic license. That's it. Curtain's closed.